and really, really cool. Again, please connect with us on YouTube and LinkedIn. Any questions, please put them in the chat. It'll ask you to create a channel if you're not logged into to YouTube um, in order to chat and you can do that. And what it's doing is just making you log in. So, um, uh, so Chris is going to go ahead and start and I'm going to hush I up. I am supposed to be muted right now. Um, Tracy's giving me the cues. We're going to be, we're going to go live real, real quickly here. What's that? We're ready. All right, we are now live, and so we, we've got a pretty big setup here, as you can tell, with lights and cameras, everything going on. Uh, I'm obviously coming to you from Orlando, Florida. Uh, we have Tony Mormino, who is actually doing the production backstage, so we're going to kind of do some things together and uh, keep working on it as we go through, but I did want to go ahead and get started and welcome everybody here. This is a PDH course, um, so I tried not to do much marketing. Um, in this process, and as from the from the marketing process, what you'll hear me, I'm going to start with an overriding thing. There is no manufacturer out there that makes a bad product. I may talk about them, I may pick on them a little bit, but they all make a great product for the right application when it's applied correctly. So that's what you're really going to hear me say. Every manufacturer is great in the proper application, but I can't fix a misapplied product. So therefore, we're going to talk today a little bit about why DX systems fail to control RH. Now, we're specifically talking about that moisture control is really what we're going after. So today's topic, we're obviously, I'm going to do a quick speaker introduction. We're going to talk about relative humidity versus dew point. This is always a fun topic for me because uh, of what we get to deal with and all the different engineers and the different uh, places. We have moisture load we're going to talk about. Then we're really going to get into that full versus part load and where do we really struggle within why DX systems fail to control RH and then how do we control moisture content we've got a lot of things going on there and then a couple of things on uh, techniques that you're going to start to have on control techniques of how we're going to do that so first who am I I'm Chris Adams um, PE registered in North Carolina I graduated from North Carolina State a long time ago, it feels like now, because it was back in 1993. I have a master's in business, and then I've been uh, in the HVAC world for about uh, 16 years now. I started actually in uh, General Electric way back when, and I was in the bigger stuff, which is nuclear turbines, gas turbines, steam turbines, a whole bunch of different things there, and then uh, came back into a family business. So it's kind of third generation, and now I'm with Insight Partners, and Insight Partners we cover from North Carolina through Central Georgia. I'm the Vice President of Engineering for Insight Partners and cover that territory to support all the account executives that we have in the area. Plus, I do some national accounts, so I get around uh, in other locations as well. So start with relative humidity versus dew point. If you can take anything away from today's presentation, please take this. Top dew point, ignore relative humidity because we can really understand what's going on in a system when we're talking dew point. Relative is what? Relative to something else. So therefore I can get the service call and I've gotten this service call before. Your, your humidity is too high. Your RH is too high. Well, that service call, my RH was 36% and they were complaining about it being too high. You didn't tell me anything. Now, to their defense, the goal was 30%. So it was high, but the temperature was 48 degrees. So think about that. That's a really, really low. So we want to talk about dew point because relative humidity is not a good measure of the moisture in the air. It's a measure of the relative moisture that it can hold. And that's really what we want to do it. So we want to talk about the accurate measurement of the moisture content in the air. So again, when you're looking at relative is the percent of moisture in the air versus how much it can hold. So as we're got a dry bulb temperature of 55 degrees, 75 degrees, 95, we still have relative humidity of 55%, but we have a lot more moisture, especially here in Orlando, than we have in other places. But we get to talk about those kind of things. So when we look at that, dew point measures, the easiest way to really describe it to those that are not going after what's going on is, it's the temperature at which it will drop out of suspension. We've got to get that moisture to drop out of suspension and we can use our Coke glasses and our ice glasses, ice water, and it will drop out of suspension right on the table as we're doing it. That's the temperature at which it drops out. 
but it's still a completely different quantity of moisture. And depending on that application, we've got to deal with the quantity of moisture. So my favorite is the people in the world that, I mean, in, we, in Florida, we hear this a lot. Oh man, it's hot. It's 95 degrees and 90% relative humidity. No, it's not. It's not going to be that because unless you're in a pressure cooker down here in some way, 90%, 90 degrees at 90% is something like 200 and something grains. The highest design load I found is within Venezuela at 189 grains. So you're not going to hit 90, 90. Now, in these presentations, I do presentations all across the, the country. I've actually been in Canada doing some presentations, have a little fun with that. I did have one guy come to me and says, 90, 90 happens. 90 degrees at 90 percent happens. So he corrected me, but we had to find it. It's not the design point. It's actually in the Persian Gulf, right there in between a couple of rivers of what's going on. So therefore, when we're looking at that, it happens in the morning, but the design temperature was 125. <laughs> so you could hit 90, 90 only in a very short period of time. So that's really what's going on is when we look at that. So now, psychrometrically, we got to look at the psychrometric chart. Most people use the psychrometric chart now is on their phone. We do have the tablets, so you can actually get those still, and you can plot it out, but I don't know many millennials that use this anymore. There's some of us older guys that use the paper. I see someone in the room here. We, we plot it out, we see what's going on, but we have to understand what the relative humidity lines look like. They're that curved line. We understand dry bulb. And remember, I had a couple of buckets there. We're following that at 55, 50% the whole way, but then we have our dew point lines associated with those three points. We've got a dew point down here, we're in control. We have a dew point of 74 at that top. We're completely out of control if we're trying to hold a normal comfort conditioning space. We have to be somewhere down here if we're doing hospitals, ORs, things like that. So we get to deal with that and understand where we're going with that relative humidity. So I always ask the question, this is my first response to anybody that calls me up and says, the relative humidity is too high. What's the fastest way to lower RH? No, turn on the heat. <laughs> you warm it up, relative humidity goes down. It's about 2.1% for every one degree of temperature. And it's easy. It's easy to control temperature. Heat's always easy. Heat's really easy here in Florida. It's not easy to get that moisture to drop out because that's where you use all your energy. When you're getting it to drop out of suspension, that's where you take all of the energy of your system to really get it to drop out. So I always say turn on the heat first. So it's what's that, what we look like. We go from a dew point A, we stay dew point straight. Guess what? We're 70% at point A, but we're uh, I think 45% at point B. And all we did was do some sensible heating very quickly as we move across that. So therefore, that's the way I always get the owner to start thinking about it, is they say, well, the RH is too high. Well, how many hotels do we have out there where the RH is too high? Quite a few, why? What's the design of a hotel hallway makeup air unit? If we think about the makeup air unit, their design point for most of the major hotels is 75 degrees at 55% relative humidity. How many general managers get somebody that comes to the desk and says, man, it's hot in that hallway, it's 75. So what do they do? They bump it down to 72. Three degrees means you went up 7% RH by design. So if you designed at 75, 55, you're now gonna run 72 at 62 and they're gonna complain, well, the relative humidity is too high. Can't do anything about it. You didn't size the equipment large enough because it wasn't designed for that. Now, why do the engineers and why do the corporate offices at those hotels design for 75? They're trying to be nice and tell you, go to your room, get out of the hallway. If you'll go to your room and be quiet, everybody else will be happy. So they're trying to be nice by telling you, go to the room. So that's really what we're looking at. So depending on where we are on the psychrometric chart, we know where we want to get to that we got a central point. That's the 75 degrees at 50% relative humidity. Then wherever you are, it's a very simple process. We're either cooling and dehumidifying, we're heating and dehumidifying, we're heating plus humidification, not very often down here, and then we're also cooling plus humidification. It really depends where you are on that psychrometric chart to define the equipment you need to use to just get there. And then it becomes what I would say a trivial project to say, if I know where I am, I know where I want to be, then I know how to design the equipment to get there. That's really what we're going after. So again, why is this important? 
if you want to accurately control humidity, you have to go look at that moisture content that you're dealing with. And it can be just be done by dew point because that tells you more about it. And people understand that point of temperature. Now, I do get to get picked on a lot. And again, I feel sorry for my kids a little bit because we were having this conversation earlier in this week with my older son, who's wanting to be a professional pilot. And he basically said they had a discussion on weather, which is very important for flying a plane. And he says, you know what? Even my instructor there said relative humidity is irrelevant. He says, you've taught me that so long. So again, I have to pick on, I've had to drag them through that, but they kind of look through that piece, but he already got it. He says, relative humidity doesn't help you depending on where you are on that altitude. Okay, so how much moisture are we talking about? Because this is kind of that next question. How much moisture are we really having to deal with within DX systems? Well, we always have a typical DX system that has some return air, and some outside air in most commercial applications. Not all, we have the dedicated outside air and then we have to watch mother nature, but we have to, we look at it, but how much are we really talking about? Well, obviously, since we're in the great state of Florida here in Orlando, this is how much moisture we're talking about. We've got Orlando here. The air conditioning design condition is 94 degrees, 76, 109 grains, but the dehumidification design is 83 degrees at 143 grains. Now, it's not the worst place in Florida because you can actually get over to Melbourne, Florida, and it's even worse. Um, and interestingly enough, look at how I got it. Myrtle Beach is the highest grain loading, and it beats out Fort Myers, Tampa, and Orlando. That's up in North Carolina on the coast. Think about what that starts to turn into. Now, again, we're looking at items in the southeast, so thank you for those that have joined us worldwide. But we're really talking about the southeast and looking at that because this is the mecca of dehumidification for us. Um, uh, there's a lot of places in the world that have the same thing. But think about that, 143 grains of moisture. So if we want a unit to be 72 degrees at 65 grains, 72 degrees, 55 percent, we have to remove 78.4 grains per pound in the outdoor air for every CFM. So I try and get that into a scenario of how much moisture does that really need? Because that's a lot of moisture when you start thinking about it. Well, think about this. A 2000 CFM unit with 25% outside air has 500 CFM. Here in Orlando, that's 27 pounds an hour. That's 3.3 gallons per hour. That's a, I mean, think about that. That's a two thirds or the basically 60% of a five gallon bucket thrown into the space of water that has to evaporate that you have to take care of with your HVAC system. Your building gets a little bit bigger, you have four times as much at 2000, 10,000 CFM, a good medical office building or something like that. We're talking 66 gallons an hour. That's 13 five gallon buckets of water that you just threw into the space every hour on that design humidity day. That's what we're talking about. Now, a fun project that I had when I was doing an indoor pool and they had the condensate, they came out and they were gonna dump it on the ground. And I said, you need to do something about that. And they're like, what do you mean? It's like, well, you've got condensate from an indoor pool coming in this area. Your design condition, it was a 140 ton pool unit. And oh, by the way, it was a little grass area surrounded by concrete, because it was a driveway. I said, congratulations, you make, you're making a swamp. <laughs> you've got to get that to drain. They're like, oh, because I think we were talking about 2,000 pounds an hour on that application that they were going to pull out. Can you imagine that, what that would have done to that little area surrounded by pavement? It would have been a lot of fun to watch. They obviously didn't have to deal with that because we caught it early. So that's really what we're talking about. So if we're talking about Orlando, now I'm going to start to break this down a little bit as to get into that scenario why I believe DX systems fail to control that relative humidity. So a sensible system design, rule of thumb, 400 CFM a ton. You hear that all the time, ah, 400 CFM a ton. Five ton nominal unit doing a 2000 CFM, guess what, your supplier temperature is gonna be about 59 degrees, 58.7. You put a latent design system, guess what, I'm now down to 333 CFM a ton and I'm at 55.8. I'm getting closer to that 55 degree temperature but we still have to deal with that because again, I'm losing a little bit of that latent control. I'm losing a bit, little bit of what's going on. And the other thing that we see is sensible only machines. They start to go unstable at about 300 CFM a ton. 
Latent machines, 100% outside air machines. I've got some as low as 100 CFM a ton. I've got a 4,000 CFM unit, which is a 40 ton unit for a what I call a medium dew point application. What's medium dew point? Medium dew point's about 42 to 50 degree dew point with the DX system. So can they do it? The answer is yes. They have to be a latent design machine because a sensible only machine won't do it. But you also have those refrigeration specialties that you get to deal with as you're going through this. And we'll, we're going to talk a little bit about that. So bringing this all together so we can move into that next piece of it is we've now understood the moisture. We've got a lot of moisture, that 13 get five gallon buckets going through. We, we're going to control to dew point. We're going to get that stable measure. We're going to look at that coil, understand what's going on. But what's really going to happen? How many systems run at full load? That 4% of the year or less, they're very, very low percentage of the time at that full load, but we've sized it for this and we're controlling that 60% range. So that 40 to 60% load range is where you're going to run that unit. So how do you deal with it? And then the sensible versus a latent design system. So it's very simple to understand the full load. You got uh, mother nature out there giving you nice hot temperatures. You actually inside here, we've got lights. We've got people, we start talking about what's going on and we start to understand the load associated with that. Well, when we're talking about trying to control the relative humidity, what are we trying to control? We're trying to control the moisture content. Well, everybody sitting in the room here and everybody there, we're about 50-50 as people. We're 50% dry, 50% wet. People tell me I'm a lot more dry because I feel a lot of hot air. So therefore, we get, we got to look at everybody in a little bit that scenario, but we say Mother Nature controls most of this about what's going on. If it gets hot outside and dry, man, it's easy to control. But if it's wet, we have to deal with that and we have to react to that. But if we go into cloudy, we're a little bit supposed to be a little bit cloudy here today. Um, I see a lot of sun for the weathermen calling for clouds. But what's that going to do to our space? Because you and I in this room did not change. We're still the same load the lights, all the computers, everything we've got, that didn't change. But what the envelope did around us, what the outside air, that does change. And so that really changes what we're looking at. So typical system, well, obviously hot load day, we've got the sun shining in, we got a unit um, up there, we've got everything going on. We've just got a space, pulls the air from the space, puts it back through the evaporator, runs the runs moisture out. We've got the compressor going on, a condenser. You'll see this kind of slide start to expand. Then we come across a fan. We might have a heater and we'll put it back into the space. But so we're just taking that heat sink. You think about what air conditioning is. Air conditioning is incredibly simple. We have a, a load and a heat sink and we're just moving heat from one side to the other. Whether we're moving it in or moving it out, it doesn't matter. It's just that heat sink of what we're doing. We're air cooled, water cooled, really don't care how we do it. It's just a matter of we've got to control it to get what we want. So this is where this all comes together. And I try to do this in such a way that it says it's a hot, semi-humid day. And so you see on the bottom corner of the slide, I've got dry bulb, wet bulb, relative humidity, and dew point. So our desired room condition right there in the top center, 75 degrees at 50%. So I've got 75 degrees, 63 degree wet bulb, 50 degree relative, or 50% relative humidity, and 55 degree dew point. So you'll see those numbers in a lot of different cases. So let's think about a design day of what we see within ARI and ASHRAE and all the different pieces. We have 95 degrees, 75. So 95 dry bulb, 75, where every air conditioning unit is rated for its performance to give that level playing field. Now, how often does that condition actually happen in Florida? Statistically, probably zero. <laughs> That's kind of an average of the country, an average of a bit, much larger space. But we're going to take that. We're 70, 95, 75. What's the return condition you typically see on all the data charts for all the manufacturers? Well, the mixed air temperature is going to be 80, 67. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Like I say, we can use it for grins and giggles right now, but we have the 80, 67 mixed with a 95, 75, knowing 95, 75 is probably drier than we would normally get in this area. The 80, 67 is probably a little warmer than we might get, but let's just kind of, again, walk through the math. And so we're, and we're going to do a latent design machine first. So first step. We take that, we do 25% outside air, we've got a mixed air temperature. All right, so now we're 83.69 of what we're doing. So we're sitting there dropping down, we're, sitting, we're looking at what's going on, but then we run that across the cooling coil. So we take it across that cooling coil and latent design machine, we're gonna drop it to 55. All right, so we're 55 degrees, everybody's happy. 
I put a block there because a lot of people call it block load. <laughs> so we have our full load condition and we're supplying that 55 degree air. And guess what? Everybody's happy. We're 75.62. We're 47% RH at a 53 degree dew point. 47% RH is great. That's exactly where we're going to run when we're at that full load conditions, assuming us engineers didn't put too much fudge factor in it. Didn't just over design a little bit too much. But again, we're nice and stable. Um, but, you know, think about that hotel we talked about. They want 72, not 75. So there's always that little bit of fudge factor that you get to build in. But that's what we're talking about. We got the outdoor air. We got the dew points. We're in cooling mode. Everything's good. But now where does this start to break down, especially in the DX system? Now, again, there's a lot of assumptions that go into these charts. There's a lot of math that I've done in psychometric behind the scenes, but there are still some assumptions. So you can pick apart this a little bit if you would like to. Um, we can have those debates and conversations. But this concept can really get it across. Now let's put a cloud up there. Let's get rid of some of that thermal load that we're dealing with. If we get rid of that thermal load, what then happens? Same chart. Let's look at it. We've got now, instead of 95.75, we're 90.74. I use the same dew point because I said, all right, we're on that same design day. We just dropped down. And then we said 78 degrees instead of 80 degrees. We start to look at what's going on. So we have a mixed air temperature now of 81. It dropped a little bit. We now have a 62 degree dew point and that design. Well, we're now going to drop down. Well, what's going to happen when we drop down? We're no longer at full load. What's the compressor going to do? On, off, on, off, on, off. Or it's going to modulate. We're going to have to slow it down. And so our average is going to slow down. Our average temperature leaving that coil is going to go up. It's not going to be 55 anymore. So what's going to happen is, all right, now we're 61. Well, the other thing I did, if you actually watch, 94% RH. Well, you're going to be close to saturated. So I kind of made that a fixed point. It says, all right, we left it 55, 54 at 94%. Is it real? Now you can you can debate it. You can move around a little bit, but it's going to be close to what's going on. And so we're 59 degree dew point. Well, now we know what our 59 degree dew point is, and we have our part load. If we were down here, man, we're great. But that part load, we're now not getting the same moisture content because what really happens when that compressor goes off? You immediately put all that moisture right back in. That coil dries out so fast because of what's going on. Now, that's what the unit's supposed to do. It's supposed to run the fan in occupied mode, recirculating, bringing in a percentage of that outside air. Because remember, we started, we had outside air. If that fan shuts off, there's still an exhaust fan somewhere else pulling that building negative, And now you've got untreated air coming into the building from somewhere. Well, you don't want that. So you've got to be running this fan for that occupied mode. Now, if you turn the fan off, yeah, that's great because the moisture drains off the coil without introducing, reintroducing as much. But that's not the type of system because we have this 25% outside air. So now what happens? Nope, we're starting to fail. We're starting to lose control of that relative humidity. We're now 75 degrees at this leaving coil dew point of 59. Therefore, we're 58%. Well, notice this was just a little bit of a drop. What happens if you keep dropping? That's really where this starts to say, what am I going to do here? Because I've got to deal with something on this latent design machine. I'm very quickly, I dropped to 85 degrees with the 76, run all the math, you end up with 70%. There are times you will be higher than this. I've run psychrometric reviews and looking at different systems. You can get above 80% in a hurry if you're not careful on these systems, on how you're looking at running it through. So, why does the DX system fail to control humidity is because we really don't get down to this temperature that we have to get down to at all times. Are there ways to do it? Sure. But here's the other thing that you've got to think about. I focused on the latent design machine first. Let's talk about a sensible design machine. Now, this sensible design machine, great machine in the right application, but it's not dropping the moisture that it really needs to. When you talk about a sensible only machine, most of them come up and say, all right, sensible design machine, they're going to achieve a, achieve a 15 to 20 degree temperature suppression across the from the return air to the supply air. Now you'll see some 15, you'll see some 18, you'll see some 20. What would the dedicated outside air unit do? Uh, 45. 
I got to get 45 degrees. I got to go from that 95 degrees to something around 55. I've got some roofs at 105. Think about that. You're trying to make that refrigerant in that system do a complete backflip and do a and start dancing. It's really tough. That's done with refrigeration specialties. Sensible machines don't have that. They don't have all that refrigeration specialty to make that refrigerant do that backflip. It's just not there. So we start to look at, well, how are we going to do it? Well, if we did a 20 degree suppression, look at this, held that 94% RH, we're now 63, 62, we're a 61 degree dew point. We lost control of that lake. We couldn't put it in there because we didn't have that machine ready to be able to handle all of that of what's going on. So that's really what I'm going after. I mean, maybe some people like, didn't like the topic of why DX systems fail to control RH. This is what we see because a lot of contractors have been out there. Well, and a lot of owners say, I can't afford that machine. So just put this one in. Guess what? They're going to still come back and complain to you to say, I can't control humidity. And you're like, I told you, <laughs> that's really what we're doing. And that's what we're dealing with all the time to try and go through this. So what can we do? The answer is we still have to achieve that 55 degree dew point. We don't have a choice. If we're trying to control that 72 to 75, I have to get there. Well, how can I get there? Can I get there with DX? Ah, sure. Absolutely, I can. There are other industry techniques as well. Sensible load also known as hot gas reheat. Remember, I have to get that load in there to be able to get that compressor to stay running. So you can say hot gas reheat. Probably the number one industry technique right now is to add that parasitic load. It truly is. Now there are other ways as well. You can do desiccants. We can dry things out. We can adsorb that moisture. It's a great way of doing it typically see that in the lower dew point applications. I've had fun. I've, I, in my career, I get to play with lots of different designs. I have designed a system at minus 80 degree dew point. I actually asked the question, what does that room feel like? I mean, think about the moisture would just kind of explode and go out of your skin. <laughs> well, it's a pharmaceutical freezer at minus 40. Okay, I get it. And I said, what else do you do in a room that's minus 80? Well, you make desiccants. All right, so how did I get the desiccant to begin with? I've had to make it in a room that was dry enough. So which came first, chicken or the egg? Again, we can start talking about that. Energy recovery. A lot of people talk about this. Be careful. Energy recovery in and of itself does not control relative humidity or dew point. It delays the process. So if you have a spike in humidity it'll, or the dew point, it'll slowly get there. It'll change slower. It'll allow your system to react. But about 45 minutes later, you're still going to have the same problem. The relative humidity doesn't work using an energy recovery that way. We have a customer of mine that kind of figured this out because they kept using those sensible only machines. And they said, well, we're going to put it on a locker room, which is 100% outside air, but we put a sense of energy recovery wheel in front of it. It'll be fine. Not every three to five years, you get to replace the compressors because the compressors can't handle those swings and temperatures trying to control that moisture and it micro slugs the compressor and it kills the compressor. Normally compressor one goes for five years in one day so that they have to pay for it again. It's not under warranty anymore. And then the next one goes in about three to five years. So that's really what we start to see. And they did, they replaced their compressors in one system four times and couldn't say, well, we couldn't afford the big, the right unit to begin with. They finally figured out it's costing them a whole lot more to replace the compressors three and four times during the 15 year life of a standard piece of equipment. A great way of doing it, slow the airflow down. We see VAVs and single zone VAVs. Now we can have this debate. I'm not a fan of the VAV system. Give me 55 degree air all the time, whether you need it or not. Not a fan of that one. I love the single zone VAV. Slow it down, let it ramp up and down at that load, get that moisture, get that 55 degree dew point and the amount of air you need. That saves you more energy than anything else is getting that fan energy down at the same time. Problem we have right now in the industry that I've seen is most people don't control that as well as they should or could. We ramp too fast. So a single zone VA fee system is supposed to ramp very slowly depending on the application. Now, some are faster than others. It depends. Now, again, the number one rule of an engineer is what, what, what's the answer to every question we ever get asked? Well, it depends. 
So you can ask me anything. I can tell you it depends. And I get all sorts of assumptions and I can make my answer sound good no matter what. But it really does say if I slow that air down properly and speed it up and down properly, I get the advantage of a VAB system with the savings of fan energy and I don't have to have the hot gas reheat parasitic load. But if you're a dedicated outside air unit, I don't have that choice to slow it down. I still need the same amount of outside air. So I've still got to have that building positively pressurized so I know where that load is coming from. I don't want untreated air coming in without me knowing. It's going to come in through cracks and crevices if it's negative. I want to know exactly where it's coming in, and I want to push it out through the cracks and crevices to protect that building on all applications except a pool. Because remember, it depends. Pools you want negative. Most buildings you want positive. Um, we also see other techniques, wraparound coils. Think about what a wraparound coil is. I'm coming in, I'm pre-treating some of that outside air, getting some of that moisture to drop out. I then run it through the standard DX system, get it down to that 55, and then I warm it back up. Well, my supply temperature is going to be higher, so I have less sensible capacity here, which is sometimes exactly what the application needs. But again, it's just one of those techniques that we can really talk about. And every application, that's where HVAC gets a little bit, you get to be creative. There's probably 10 solutions to every HVAC application there out there. You get to choose which one you like, depending on, number one, there's cost of factors that you get to deal with, what you can afford, what the energy profile is, a lot of different things. So they'll design very differently up in a northeast where the power is very, very high, or if you get down into the islands where the power is really expensive, or you're going around here where we've got actually very good power rates. Um, so we get to start looking at that. So again, that engineering answer, which one are you going to use? It depends. Let's look at the application. Let's talk about it. Let's understand what's going on. So let's talk about the hot gas reheat view. So think about where that is. Now we've got this part load, 85 degrees, 76. We got that 66 degrees where that's 70% relative humidity. How do we handle that? Well, we know we must achieve dew point. We got to get down here. We've got to get to that dew point, but then we got to get back to that same line to hold that space that we really want to go through. So we can do that by adding that false load. We add that false load. Remember that first slide, 47%. We're right back there at it. It's that simple. And we get to control that reheat. Now, one of the things I like about showing this slide this way is, notice I'm going to 66 degree supply air temperature. Worst machine I can design, in my opinion, is a neutral air machine. There's a lot of people out there that design a neutral air machine. So they'll turn on one machine to run it down to the dew point, reheat it back up to neutral to have another machine turn on and cool the space back off. Why not just use, I've already gotten down there. I'm already at 55. So therefore use that, come up to 66, that's fine. What if it's cold? I could actually take this false load reheat. I've already used the, I've got the energy. I could actually overshoot. I could go up over the top and heat and dehumidify at the same time in certain applications. You'll see that sometimes in the conference rooms that are interior to a space. You've got to get that reheat and you can move that around. So that's where that false load. So I get to take it back to my psychometric side of things. Now, people pick on this one every once in a while, but it, I think it makes the point really well. We have the outside air. We have our return air. So wherever we are, we have a mixed air condition. We run this mixed air condition down along the cooling coil and we have some leaving air temperature, whatever that leaving air temperature is. We pick up the fan heat. So the fan's going to heat it up. It's a draw-through fan. We're going to get some fan heat. And we're going to warm up along the uh, room sensible heat ratio line. And we're going to come back to that ideal condition. Well, let's think about that. We've got our unit leaving air condition. We know it's kind of going to get close to being fixed of where it's going to be. But what happens in that part load when that compressor starts to cycle? We have that average unit leaving air condition. Now we've actually controlled the temperature because remember, temperature control is easy. Humidity control is not. So therefore, that's the exact same temperature. But we're a lot higher humidity if you think about the way the curves ramp up on relative humidity. That's where we start to have that 70%. We also know our ideal room condition. We know where we want to end up. So how do we get there? An easy way to think about this is we've got the room sensible heat factor ratio line. Well, guess what it has to cross? It's got to cross that, return, that ideal room condition. We now know about the reheat that we're going to need. Now, again, you can pick on me and run all the math and that, that line is not exactly the same in different conditions. But from a fundamental standpoint, this is going to be pretty close. 
of exactly what's going on. That's the hot gas reheat side of things of how we get there and we know what we need to do. But again, we didn't have to get all the way up to temperature in this case because we still have some room on that sensible ratio of heat line. That's where we're going for. So we have different system schematics. Now you can see now, I'm now talking about what are refrigeration specialties a little bit. And this is an entire course in and of itself. This is another topic altogether. We have our space, we have our evaporator coil, we have our reheat coil, we have a supply fan. That's the same. Evaporator, reheat, supply fan, space. Same thing over here. I've actually got two different types. This is gonna be looking at a parallel as compared to a series form of reheat. So when I talk about that, you've got your compressor, you come out, you make a decision. I'm gonna to go to the reheat coil first, then I'm still gonna to go to the condenser coil, then I've got some refrigeration specialties and come back through. Where this guy over here, I come out and I decide, I go one way or the other, I don't go both. Now this is typically done in a split system. This is typically done in a package unit because you think about a split system. I come off the compressor hot, 160 to 180 degrees, sometimes hotter. I go to that reheat coil, condenser number one. If I'm a split system, it's a long way to get back to that condenser coil. So if I can just flip flop right over to the reheat, the evaporator coil, it's real simple. It makes it tougher to control, yes. Can it be done? Absolutely. Refrigeration specialties. We deal with the same thing in all the systems. Some of the package units are changing. There's a lot of different people that talk a little bit differently about reheat and things like that. But fundamentally, this is what you're gonna see. This is how it's gonna work. So we kind of talk about those and how we get through that. All right, let's switch gears. How about a desiccant style? So, I mean, desiccants are great at controlling humidity. We have the same thing. Think about that. We've got that part load of where it would be. Desiccants come from the other side. So we take that outside air, we mix it with the return air, we have mixed air, but now we get it really hot and dry because as that latent heat of vaporization happens and absorption, you get really hot. We were actually in a couple of meetings there this week. I've been traveling across uh, Florida this week. and we there. How hot does it get? What's my engineering answer? Well, it depends. <laughs> what does it depend on? What temperature are you starting at? You can actually start at 45 degrees coming into this desiccant and leave it at 87. Well, guess what? If you come in at 75, you might be leaving at 120. Think about that sensible load you just added. Does great for the application because what happens at 32 with water is really tough to do with DX. It means you can't it turns into an iceberg. So you have to look at it in this system when it's going that. Now, most desiccants, you notice I've got a mixed air prime down here. Most desiccants are not full flow desiccants. Now, you can do it that way, but most systems that we see, you partial, you take some of that air off, hyper dry it, get it really, really dry, really, really hot, and then mix it back in. So you basically, you mix it, get it super hot, super dry, mix it in with the rest, and then you come back in. Well, then think about where that sensible heat ratio line was. If we get still to cross that line, sometimes we have to have post cooling to get back to this line. Sometimes you don't, sometimes you can hit it from this side. If it, every, everything just lines up and mother nature is agreed, you can come right down, hit that line, you're done. But sometimes in most cases, because a desiccant gives off such hot air, you have pre-cooling and post cooling. Sometimes you talk, we talked about that minus 80. You'll also have purge. You'll also have other things. You'll have regeneration of the wheel. Again, lots of different things that you're going to go through in that regard. We talked about the heat wheels. Again, yes, they dehumidify. But in some cases, they create an even tougher part load condition because they take more load off the DX side. You can make your system worse at times from a moisture content. Now, you save energy. Absolutely, if you've designed it right. I recommend it all the time, but it has a grain suppression, 118 down to 80 in this example. Great dehumidification and very inexpensive because it's a fractional horse motor that's just kind of rotating. Not a lot to it, but again, if downstream your DX side is not right, you're gonna have more of a moisture issue. My favorite the conversation I had with another customer is it was a big box store, just big open warehouse. And they said, yeah, we did a lot of energy savings. We put in demand control ventilation. I said, ah, you spiked your relative humidity too at the same time, didn't you? Yeah, how'd you know that? Psychometrics. You increased your part load because you pulled the load off of the building because you have less demand control. So with CO2, you lower the outside air, 
that outside air was your load. You lost your load, you increased part load. He had a spike from about 50% up to 65 to 68% and was like, what happened? You saved energy. Huh. You got to add something else. You got to add something back. That's what we're really talking about. How do we then control that? Please don't confuse hot gas bypass and hot gas reheat. This is a semantic discussion, but you'll hear a lot of people say, well, put hot gas bypass in it. Hot gas bypass is not hot gas reheat. So again, another topic in and of itself. I've heard things like the double bypass where you've got valves that bypass some of the refrigeration on the evaporator side, or they bypass the condenser coil. There are certain applications for those valves that do a great job, again, in the right application. What's the most common use of that valve? For a unit that turns the supply fan off. And it has, it, it'll, it allows that unit to run better at a part load condition. But if it's a hunt, if it's a mixed air condition where that fan's always running, that load's coming in no matter what. It'll have a little bit of, of uh, suppression of that dew point, but not enough. Because you think about the reheat, I'm taking hot off of the coil and putting it back in the airstream. A bypass, I'm taking the hot and throwing it away right after the event. I just did all my cooling and expansion and put hot gas right back to it. So I threw away that energy. You try not to do hot gas bypass. If you can avoid hot gas bypass, do it. Even ASHRAE says you have to avoid hot gas bypass because there's a maximum amount you're allowed. It's like 15% in most in some applications and 10% in others of the amount of bypass. So you have to watch that. So don't confuse that. So what we can do? Again, we go back to still must achieve that dew point. We talked about these three pretty specifically. We talked, and then we didn't talk about these too much. We've got those out there. Are there others? Ah, sure. There's a lot of others that we can deal with, but that's where you have to look at it from that engineering perspective. Look at the design, get yourself back to that. How do I control and get to that dew point that is demanded for that space? That's really what we're going after. So that's where the DX systems really start to go. So how is this controlled in that DX? I kind of alluded to it a little earlier. We take this mixed air condition. We get down to this dew point that we need, and then we warm it back up to where we really need to supply it. Whether it's a cooler air, a neutral air, or a warm air, we call this in the control world a supply or space temperature reset. So we know what's going on. Required sensors to be able to pull this off though. I got to look at outside air. I've got to know what the outside air is doing. I have to know what I'm leaving that coil. Now there's a couple of different ways. You can measure the temperature directly and leave that coil. Um, you can also measure the suction pressure because refrigerant has a nice temperature pressure chart. I know exactly what that refrigerant temperature is and I can test for that application what the actual supply air temperature would be based on the approach. So let's say if I'm at 55 degrees on my supply air temperature, that's probably a 50 degree coil suction pressure wise. It might be 47, 48, might be 30. You just don't know because each different, each unit is a little bit differently because the airflow changes. But once you set that up, you know what that number is. You now have your control point. This is how I run a variable speed compressor. I look at this suction pressure to know this is what I need this coil to make sure I'm maximizing my dew point control of what's going on. And then you have to have supply air temperature. It's nice for that space temperature reset, you have to have the room temperature. This is that neutral air machine that I think is not very wise because it throws away energy. Now, I put in here a little question. Optional enhancement, room humidity. Do I really need a room relative humidity sensor? In theory, if everything is working correctly, what's my room going to do? It's going to be this 53 degree dew point. So if I have the temperature, and I have the dew point, I know the relative humidity. I'm done. I really don't have to have that. So why is this then, why do I call that an enhancement? Well, the enhancement side of it is the way I look at it is, what happens here if I want 50 degrees? What if I want 48 degrees? I can enhance this system by saying, hey, that room humidity is getting a little higher than I'd like. Make that compressor run a little bit harder run it a little bit colder. 
run that single zone VAV maybe a little bit slower for a little bit longer to see if I can hold it. Those are the type of things from a control logic standpoint that you build in. And I have to have those real force four sensors and I can enhance it even further with a room real humidity sensor. Okay, so can, how do we get DX systems to go from fail to excel? When applied correctly and controlled properly. That's really all we are doing. So the key understanding, so kind of the summary of my topic of what, why the DX systems fail to control. Latent design machines require, I'm throwing a new number out here. That's about where you should stop at 42 degrees. I have some DX machines out there that I'm controlling down to 38 degree dew point. But think about that. I've got from 38 to 32, I've got a very tight approach before I make an iceberg. It's really tough to control. There's certain applications it works. 42 is a safer number. Sensible machines, you're typically gonna see about 60 degree dew point. That's what they're gonna control to if they're doing well. If they've got too much outside area, I mean, you think about it. I've talked about a low volume of outside air on this entire topic. What was it? 25% outside air on a semi-humid day. And I showed you it could fail. So therefore, if it gets a really humid day, you're done. So that's 60 degree dew point. Are there some applications a sensible will go lower? Yeah, just like my latent machine, I got it down to 38, I can get a sensible machine lower. What are they all gonna tell you? All those manufacturers, oh, 55 degrees dew point is easy. Yeah under the right load conditions without much outside air, 10% less outside air, I don't care who you use. Everybody's great at that. Below 42, I would I start considering desiccants. I really look at desiccants because the other thing about a desiccant, think about that heat it generates. If I can combine it with a DX system, I can add that heat from the DX back into the sensible side of the DX and stabilize the refrigeration circuit. Maybe I don't need as significant of a refrigeration specialty. I can do that with a desiccant to provide warm, dry air back to the DX side. A sensible only machine runs great. It gets nice and cold really fast. No moisture, no condensate pan, all sorts of things that you can deal with if you apply it correctly. Controlling to that dew point provides that stability, but you've got to have the proper sensors to follow the psychrometric side of it. Adding technologies can enhance performance, but again, fundamentals are always going to be required. That single zone VAV, that energy recovery, that wraparound coil, all of those can be added to technologies, but you still have to get back to that same dew point. So with that, that's the end of my topic. Thank you for joining us. Obviously, we are, you see the camera and the setup in front of me for those in the room. So we have been going through all the different places. Uh, with Insight Partners, what we have actually started to do is our best customer is an educated customer. So you see the picture here of Tony. Tony's actually on the screen live. Tracy's watching Tony. It's about a 30 to 45 second delay. So they're gonna read right behind us. But Tony puts it out, he manages these channels. We're recording this session as well. This session will hit our YouTube channel as well. So if you want to go back and review anything, if you want to then go do some of the psychrometrics and send it back to me and pick on me about where I might've messed up and said something, I'm perfectly okay with that because it's a fun conversation. I had one of Mark Boggs and Mark Boggs is an account manager down here in Florida. One of his customers, actually, I was doing the first presentation. He got off. He said, this guy's nuts and hung up. So this is the guy right here. Oh, I got him. I got him in the room. And then the next presentation, Kirk Patton was giving it and I got to chat and we had a great conversation, I thought. And I'm not too crazy, am I? <laughs> So therefore, I appreciate that's the type of topic because that's going on. And as we talk about the room, because we're about we're coming up on our our uh, 1230 stop for going live here. But there's a couple other we're going to stay in the room and talk if you want to. We can ask some questions. We can talk about some things. We can have some fun. Uh, we can pick on the question that I asked him is why I got him to hang up off the one call. Uh, we can talk about that one. But that's really where we are. So if you have any questions in the room, we can take that. I think Tony wants to uh, share some things first and then uh, we'll put us back online. Because I think he was gonna share it with the, the folks online. All right, I'm, I, I think I'm good, Chris. Thank you so much, that was amazing. So sorry, we're gonna be um, in the room. I ask that you, <laughs> if you enjoyed this, please uh, join us on YouTube, subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on LinkedIn. Both the links are in the chat. You can also get your PDH uh, certificate direct from me. 
My email address is in the chat. Uh, we had a lot of questions about where this video will live. It will live on our YouTube channel. So please subscribe to us. You'll get all the updates. We have a lot of fun stuff coming up. We have uh, several things over the next couple weeks, and we're going to continue to create more content. So um, please stick around. Chris is going to answer all the questions in the chat, and I'm sure he's going to have some questions in the audience. So take it away, Chris. Okay. So again, we're going to just freeform now a little bit. So I'll, get to, I'll go ahead and ask the question just for fun. This is the question that he beat me up on a little bit. So my question, what's that? So oh, there's questions in there as well. So we'll get some of those. So Tracy will ask us some of those. The question I asked was, all right, so we've got a typical application of a school application, whatever that school is, it doesn't matter. Um, high school, whatever classroom going on, we're looking for 72 degrees and 55. You got the big kids in there, you're in high school. The room's warm. You've got some air conditioning. You got an air conditioning demand. You need to cool the room off because of that internal load. Well, outside, you've got the typical Florida monsoon, but it's cold. It's wintertime. It's 55 degrees and raining. Should you economize? At 55 degrees and raining, he's not allowed to answer. <laughs> At 55 degrees, would you economize? And anybody, yes or no? I mean, people say I'm nuts, and everybody says no, you should not economize, right? You're 55 degrees and raining. Why are you 55 degrees and raining? Well, you're 100% relative humidity. Your 100% relative humidity you're bringing into the space. Are you really? It's 55 degree dew point. What's the leaving coil temperature that you're going after? Huh, 55 degrees and dripping wet. If you're coming across a latent design machine, you're bringing air and making it 55 degrees and raining. It's okay to economize. Now, where we got sidetracked a little bit is, are you gonna need more cooling? Maybe. I didn't say turn off the compressors. I said economizing is stage one. Bring in that 55 degree air. If it hits that room sensible heat ratio line, great, you're done. Great economizing condition. Then you might need another compressor still because you might want to go colder than 55 because now we're 55, we're going down to 45 degree dew point and really getting it under control faster. That's a good thing. Remember I talked about that room enhancement. Understand that humidity, it's a great thing. But that's an aha moment. It was an aha moment for me in my review as well. 55 degrees and raining, I should bring in as economizing. Well, think about it from a control standpoint. The control standpoint is, are you doing enthalpy or sensible? Well, let's say if you have a control system, I would go enthalpy. Great, do it. If you're sensible only system, what do you set the sensible dial for? Eh, typically 55. What do you set that sensible dial for? the dew point temperature. It's really what you said, whatever you wanna control in your space, it's irrelevant whether it's raining or not. It's 55 degrees and raining, doesn't matter, it's 55 degrees. It's bringing it in. Now, when you think about some of the most machines that we deal with, economizing stage one, stage two, compressor one, stage three, compressor three, you actually added a stage. You got a bigger unit now all of a sudden because 55 degrees and rain, so we can do that. All right, questions, comments, yes. So you, on your single zone, talked about slowing the system down. We have we have problems with that all the time. So we like to specify derivative only, not uh, proportional integral derivative. Oh, you go, you go actually derivative truly. So you got some good control set because most people are afraid to death of derivative because they can't get control of it. No, we like it better. We want to yep. really slow it down. I just, interested in your thoughts on that. So my thoughts are, again, again, I get to always start with the, yes? All right, so repeating the question. The question is, on a single zone VAV system, should we, how, we talk about some people ramp it up and down too fast, what's the best way? And one suggestion in the room that we have here is not doing a PID, but just doing the D, not doing the proportional integral, doing the D. I have not heard of that and people doing that because again, most control contractors have trouble with the P. Yeah. <laughs> get the P and the I and it's a time constant in there and then you get to the D, I mean, they're all just kind of blown up. So the answer is when I look at that, I haven't tried that either on the derivative side, but the concept is this. If these, it depends on the space as always, but if your space load is stable, ramp it as slowly as you can to be able to match the load at that dew point, get that coil temperature nice and cold 
and then slowly ramp up. Now, what's going to happen is as the temperature, most they apply these in a lot of different locations where sometimes the load is aggressive. Think about a church or an auditorium. You got 15 minutes, everybody's there. 15 minutes, everybody's gone. That's not generally a great solution for a single zone VAV. Now, is it, does it work? Yes, when it's not loaded, because that type of application is rarely loaded. And so all the time there, but then how do you control when I know I'm occupied and not, when do I see that people, send the number of people coming in? And that's where you have to adjust that ramp speed. You want it as slow as possible, but if it gets too far out of control, you then have to increase your ramp. Classrooms, you increase that ramp early on, but again, think about when their kids are coming into classrooms. It's in the morning when there's not a heavy thermal load. There may be heavy moisture load, but not a thermal load, so that you can ramp it slowly in a classroom and through that day. What we typically see always, especially when the people add the derivative, you see that Western door swing back and forth, back and forth, hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold. We see that in everything. Unfortunately, so in a control world, there is no such thing as a bad controller, but there's a heck of a lot of bad programmers out there because they don't understand that system, how it ties to truly trying to approach. Now we have the same problem with our owners. I truly, I walked in, it was, it was, it was an ashtray meeting. Now it was an ashtray meeting at a university. We walk in there and guess what? We're now 10 people all of a sudden in the conference room. Okay, great. It's set for 72 degrees. The space temperature was 73 and a half to 74 degrees. Now, where was this ASHRAE meeting I was having with the university at the facilities group? The facility guy calls up, hey, by the way, this room's hot, 74 degrees. Can you fix it? It's only 74. <laughs> Why do we need to change that fast? That was an incredibly quick call, and it shows the owners we're dealing with. I want 72, plus or minus what? Nothing. You can't. DX systems, you want to float. You want, and remember, we talk about refrigeration stability. Increase that dead band. What, does we, what do we have in the United States? What is the dead band by design that we as engineers are allowed to design to? Plus or minus five is what we're actually supposed to design to. 73 degrees plus or minus five, because we're not supposed to be turning cooling until it's 78, and we're supposed to heat below 68. So we're 73 degrees plus or minus five by code design. That was Jimmy Carter. <laughs> a lot of the young guys in the room like, ooh. <laughs> but think, that's what it is. Can you imagine what that guy on the facilities would have picked up the call if it was 78? He called it 73 and a half to 70. I was like, I'm, I'm actually, I love it cold. I was still comfortable. And he's already freaking out and calling, making people jump up. That's what our teachers do as well. That's what our owners do as well. That's what they all do. They want that 72 degrees. It's not the best solution. The, if you actually, what you typically run into, if you get that moisture content under control, yeah, they're much more flexible to temperature. Now, the other thing is what's the trick we all use? You put the thermostat on the wall and just screw it to the wall. It doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't have any wires. It just shows the temperature and it shows 72. Oh, man, I must be, I must be hot, but that says 72. No, I guess I'm comfortable. <laughs> That's, I mean, you think about it. If you take some of the international manufacturers, the VRF manufacturers, it comes by default and shows you the set point. It does not show you the actual temperature. You have to know the super secret codes in the service to change it over. Okay. How about a question from uh, Tony? First, there was a comment when you were speaking about the 55 degree and economizing. Um, Hans stated that it depended on entropy, and that's when you got into the controls. I thought that was quite <laughs> <laughs> It absolutely depends on what you think about it. It's, it's, it's definitely an enthalpy question. But think about it. We can't get people to understand RH in a lot of cases. Try to explain enthalpy to them. Wow. Okay. Uh, okay. Dave G um, made the comment when you were in your presentation that um, there's a lot of people that are 
is critical for indoor cannabis cultivation systems. And he says, at the moment, many cultivation rooms utilize standalone dehumidifiers. If you want to speak about it, I know it's a, it's a yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we've got indoor grow houses as a question, and we talked about the dew point control. Well, the best way to describe the dew point control and the relative humidity control of an indoor grow house is it's a Disney ride. We're in Florida. It changes based on the mode. It changes whether we're watering or whether we're just kind of nighttime at sleep. So there's a watering in the day with the sunlight. There's some. There's all these different modes that you have to do, and you actually have to move the dehumidification around with it. Um, we see some with standalone dehumidification, but we actually do a lot with DX and a reheat scenario of looking at it. So reheat is kind of a brute force. Um, I'm still of the opinion that brute force is really good down to that 55 degree dew point, 55 to 42. Sometimes it's better to do a really, a smaller piece that does a massive dehumidification, really dries that sponge. And there's customers out there, if you think about some of the big box stores that we deal with, they have a lot of sensible only machines and then over a freezer compartment, like a supermarket or anything like that, they put a massive dehumidifier. It soaks up all the moisture out of the space using that one. So the rest of the equipment can be less expensive. In the grand scheme, the net cost is lower. So we do that in the grow houses as well, depending on the application of what's going on. Now in the room, just to say, I do know that there's a one o'clock that you guys, if you have to go um, at any time, we'll, I'll keep this dialogue going. Um, but at the same time, I know that some of them are going to, uh, again, if I walked out there, I know the golf pro would start laughing at my swing more than anything. So uh, that's where I know they're doing golf clinics. So, all right, uh, one more online. Okay. We have a couple more, but so, we'll get one in the room next if somebody's got some. Um, repeat it. Yes. Why is hot gas reheat a parasitic load? Why is hot gas reheat a parasitic load? Well, you think about what's going on, and again, that may be the, not the right term to call it a parasitic, because when you think about the hot gas reheat, I've already done all the dehumidification. I am reusing that energy, which makes it not a parasitic load in that sense, but we're false loading the space. If I didn't have to false load to get that dew point, I could turn the unit off. That's more energy efficient. There's nothing more efficient than off. So that dew point control. So whether you call it a parasitic load, again, great question from the standpoint of it's not, it is truly reusing that reheat that we've already done to control dew point. So you could make the argument that's not, that that's a wrong term. All right, anything in the, in the room? Cool, yeah, we, just, just the international guys. <laughs> I don't know if um, are standalone dehumidifiers like Quest more efficient than system equipment hot gas reheat? If you ask Quest, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, most dehumidifiers, so typical dehumidifier, dehumidification system, it takes how many BTUs per pound of moisture removed? A typical, some of the numbers that if you go back through and you read, you have to get past some of the documentation of what's going on. Um, but they say about a thousand BTU per pound for moisture removal using a DX system or 2,500 BTU per pound of moisture removed on a desiccant type system. But again, it still depends. It depends on where you're trying to go because can you save energy using a desiccant? Yes, absolutely, in the right application, but not always. And so it depends. I don't know the quest specifically, but at the same time, we've got, I've worked with three different desiccant dehumidifier manufacturers and most of them do claim, hey, we're more efficient. Well, you think about that. I'm efficient at getting moisture out, but then I got to add another system to cool it back off. So in and of itself, it can be very, very efficient, but what's the net total on whether a Quest system dehumidifier is more efficient than a DX and hot gas reheat? Again, it depends on what level you're going on that dehumidification on which way it's going to give you the best report. Right. Yep. In a sealed indoor cultivation environment with high heat and humidity, is it best to have separate systems for heat and humidity, or is it best to have one system controlling both heat and humidity? Can everybody in the room answer the question? It's it depends. Um, um, <laughs> So uh, I, I guess there's a space question there more than anything in my view, because do I like redundant systems? Yes, I like redundant systems. So we're trying to talk about, is it better to isolate and separate 
the heat system from the dehumidification system? And the answer is, I don't think so. I think I can actually use some economies of scale. I personally don't think I would design it that way. Um, uh, I, can, I could probably debate both sides of it, of whether I would isolate those systems completely. Um, but at the same time, the only thing about mechanical equipment that we guarantee is it will break and it will be at the most inopportune time. Every other guarantee, we, you mean, we can guarantee conditions, but I can't do it for 24-7, 365, unless you have three systems because I have one, then a redundant, then a redundant. Then I can guarantee it. So you get that scenario. So I don't think I would split it normally uh, unless there was a cause. I mean, you could split things out. I mean, what do we split systems up for? Is typically because of structure. We've got to spread weight out to try and save money on the structural. We'll have an air handler over here with a condenser over here. We'll put the air handler here and the condenser on the ground. I mean, we'll do some things like that. Uh, but normally, I, I mean, I try and combine them into a system um, depending on the redundancy level that's necessary. What I would typically, I mean, again, what we typically see in grow houses right now is we are controlling the humidity side by dehumidifying a lot because it is a closed system. Uh, of what's going on. And we do a lot of multiple systems. So you have, I mean, some of the systems, again, Mark, help me out. I mean, we've got, I mean, uh, well, actually Adam Schaefer's done a bunch as well. I mean, 10, 15, 350 water source heat pumps. I mean, tons and tons of redundancy built in on systems like that is what I typically see. I don't see it isolated. Now, what I do see on isolation, again, go away from the grow house, I do like the ability if you can isolate the sensible load from the latent load because latent equipment, guess what? It's specialty, it's more expensive. So the more sensible you can put in, the lower the cost, but you still have to have that latent control. So if you have one little bit bigger latent control system isolated from the sensible, you actually get some built-in redundancy as well. If your latent system, 100% outside DOAS unit goes out, you got all these latent units that are the sensible units that are going to try and control. You got a couple of days. I mean, you might have some high humidity, but you you turn that unit off and you stop pumping in hot air. Well, what happens if the sensible systems go out? Well, great. Turn this other unit and recirculate it if you can and control the temperature. Yeah, I'm going to have a higher CO2 for a short period of time, but I get a chance. They think about the, the whole discussion on CO2 and demand control ventilation. Kids learn better with higher oxygen content. What's the number? Eh, it's debatable. It depends. 800 to 1,200 parts per million is very common. What happens at 1,500? We get sleepy. Well, luckily, I must not be must have a, a good CO2 control because nobody looks sleepy in the room. But again, what's the debate? So, well, are they going to learn better also when it's hot or cold? The temperature also matters just as much as the CO2. If you're super hot, you're not going to be paying attention either. So therefore, I don't know how some of the older guys in the room, how we survived because I didn't have air conditioning in my school. I was hot all the time. <laughs> now, we obviously want them temperature controlled. We want them comfortable with dry. We want no mold and mildew. I mean, my favorite comment that I always make as well is, you can have any condition you want in a space as long as you have no energy and no refrigerant use. <laughs> That's what DOE and ASHRAE point us to. But that's where we're taking equipment. We're making it so much more sophisticated to do that Disney ride across the psychrometric chart. So you're all, you're essentially running this equipment right there on the red line. Anything trips, any sensor. Think about the number of sensors. We still put too many sensors on equipment right now. When you're putting sensors on a piece of equipment, put the ones you need to control it, that you need to make decisions on if it's working or not. You don't need all these peripheral sensors that are just information only because I can tell you they're not going to use them anyways. They're going to still call a service tech and say, hey, what's wrong? Temperature's hot. What's wrong? You didn't use a sensor. Why'd you pay for it? It's about 250 bucks a sensor. Easy. So why would you do that? So, okay. I don't know if I answered that question or not as well, but yeah, just depending on, it depends on the application, whether you isolate or not, depends. I mean, it, it, there's a lot of factors to that. I mean, I've got, we were actually in a meeting yesterday talking about systems and I actually, 45 degree, 44 degree dew point application, it was a big enough warehouse, I started to suggest we might need to look at a desiccant to be able to enhance the refrigeration stability. So there's things like that that you would put into those factors. And how critical is that product? Because again, you think about, you get into life safety, it's critical product. 
you get into emergency rooms and things like that. It's critical product. A lot of warehouses for pharmaceutical warehouses. You got turnover rate. You got chemotherapy mixing drugs. All becomes very, very critical. Okay. Any others? Yeah, three more. Three more. Uh, Jaren asks, what's your recommendation on leaving dew point temperature to design to on so, no as for a VRF system in a school? And is there anything to look out for? Okay, so what is the leaving dew point design on a school for a DOAS unit that also has a VRF system? That's exactly what we did just talk about. Separate the sensible and the latent. It's the perfect application for a VRF. What's the space you temperature you want? You want 72 degrees and 55%. Therefore, that DOAS should be about 55% because it's truly isolated. You can make the argument that I might want to go a little bit lower. You can also make the argument you might want to go a little bit higher and rely on the VRF to do some of it. I'm of the opinion I want to go lower. I absolutely want to go lower so I can isolate that out because why? What happens on a VRF system? It lowers, it ramps its way down. It unloads that compressor. That average leaving air temperature is higher. You've isolated properly the latent then you don't have to worry about the latent load within the VRF. Now, VRF would come back and tell you, I absolutely in a VRF system can do moisture control. I've got it colder. And they're right because they actually have a control sequence that looks at superheat primarily. So it's still, even when it's unloading, it ramps it up, self up and down and gets you a colder supply air temperature than you need. But at the same time, it's a whole lot easier and it runs a lot with a lot more stability if you get that dew point and you've isolated out and your dew point control lower than that 55 or whatever that space. Let's say you wanted, they wanted a 72 degrees at 50% RH. That's a little, that's a 53 degree dew point. That's the design point. Okay. Two more. Yes. Uh, okay. Scott um, says we've seen problem with hot gas reheat. The refrigerant pressure coming off the reheat coil is a lot lower than from the condenser. So lots of refrigerant management issues. How do you deal with that? That's all the refrigeration specialties. That's done by manufacturer. Manufacturers do it all differently. So I'll, I'll make a comment. So it's talking about how do you get the stability of the, the reheat circuit because of the pressures and how do you control that refrigerant? A favorite article of mine when I first started, and going back, so I'll date myself, I started in the industry in 2004, so this is 2005, I get an article in ASHRAE, and I'm reading the article, and it's talking about hot gas reheat, and this article is going through, and again, I get, remember I told you, I'll pick on manufacturers, but at the same time, they make great equipment for the right application, so was, the whole article was, Here's one way to do reheat. Here's another way to do reheat. Here's another. It's like seven different ways to do reheat. And they said, the best way possible was this, but nobody can control it. Well, they didn't realize that was what one of the manufacturers is currently doing when they wrote the article is that's exactly what they were doing. So, and this was the head of engineering for the one manufacturer that said it can't be done, but the other manufacturer had already figured it out. So we talk about that offline, but that's really those refrigeration specialties. That's where we talk about ASHRAE being kind of its own worst enemy in that regard. And DOE, no power, no refrigerant. Well, what do we've changed to? We've changed to micro channel coils, less refrigerant. But I have to have refrigerant management exactly in that case, and I've got no place to store it. How do I store the refrigerant if I've reduced my refrigerant? Well, you have receiver tanks, you have things like that, you've got accumulators, you've got all these things that are used to be able to deal with that the best you can. But what I would say is the number one control problem with regard to that is trying to move too fast. Because you think about a hot gas reheat system. We have a supply fan as a single zone VAV that can modulate. We have an electronic or an e, a TXV that modulates. We have condenser fans that modulate. We have a hot gas reheat coil that modulates. We have mother nature that modulates. You have five, six things all modulating at once. You move one too fast, the others start bouncing. So you have to be very precise on your control and allow your dead bands to be bigger to be able to get that refrigerant stability through those processes. Oh, I got somebody laughing at me on this one. Okay, so now you're back to two. Oh, um, okay. well, I'm only going to take two more, so then we're going to we're going to cut it. So we'll get the one, but she has laughing at one, so something's going no, on. Oh, just the, the, all of a sudden there's another one, but we're good. So um, Hamza would like to know what is the maximum capacity reduction you can achieve with hot gas bypass. 
Uh, well, by code, it says 10% or 15% is where you're supposed to as the max. Capacity reduction, I'm gonna say, so the question is, what's the maximum capacity reduction you can get with hot gas bypass? My answer to that is don't do it because it's a waste of energy. Uh, there is our manufacturers out there that say I had hot gas bypass for capacity control. Don't do it. I don't think it's the right solution. Use the other technologies that are better equipped to do it. Go to an inverter driven compressor, do a VFD compressor, do a digital scroll compressor, do some other technology because that hot gas bypass, truly we talked about it. You did all that compression and all that work to throw it away. It's complete loss of energy. So yes, you get the 15% capacity reduction as ASHRAE says, you can do that. And you actually get more capacity reduction than that because you're taking 180 degrees, mixing it with 90 degrees coming out of the condenser. So you're getting rid of a lot that's just all of a sudden flash to 50. So you're getting rid of a lot of capacity, but at the same thing, it's the wrong solution. It's not the best way to do it. There are better technologies that will do that job. All right, last question. The last one is from Abhinav and he asks, can we define a range where without de uh, de a de dehumidifier, we can't maintain 5.5 grains per kilogram? And is there any rule of thumb where you can check a chart and say you need a dehumidifier? I don't know, but it obviously goes to international because you were talking about the other, uh, some of the kilowatts and all that kind of stuff. So the way I would answer that question, so it's, is there a rule of thumb um, with regard to when you're going to need a dehumidifier and when you're not going to need a dehumidifier. I'll answer this question this way. So we're, obviously we've talked about latent design. We're talking about that latent control of what's going on. So when I want to control latent, I've got to know what's happening in the application. I alluded to it during the middle of the presentation at one time. What do I consider a high volume outside air machine? Well, you saw my number. All of the charts I had started at 25% outside air. If you're above 25% outside air, whatever it is, in a humid climate, you're probably going to need some form of dehumidification. Probably. Now, if you're feeding a data center, probably not. Because you've got so much internal dry heat, there's your reheat. Then, so it says 25% and above, I'm absolutely rule of thumb, I'm gonna apply a dehumidification question. How am I gonna control that late? 10% to 25%, it depends, really does. What's the application? 10% and less, you're probably gonna get away with just about anything. You still could have a moisture problem. You probably will have a moisture problem, but how bad is that moisture problem going to be? So it's defined by mother nature. If you're in the tropics, it's gonna be all the time. But if you're in a place that swings up and down and kind of moves around a little bit, 10% outside or less, yeah, you might be high humidity for a couple of days, couple of weeks, but then the rest of the year, you're gonna be fine. That's okay. It's not, I mean, that's the one thing. Oh my gosh, we're above 60%. So how long are you there is more important. Mold grows and mildew grows, or sorry, in the legal terms, a moisture related event because they don't like the mold and mildew word. Um, the moisture related event says if it's there for two weeks and it goes away and you get control, you're probably not going to have a problem. But if you're 85% and humid, two weeks is going to be a massive problem. So it depends on that. But you're probably not going to hit that with 10% or less. That 10 to 25% range, that's where all your design techniques occur. Above 25% outside air, we've got lots of refrigeration specialties that we're going to need to deal with. Mother Nature is going to throw a curveball. She doesn't care what we say. She's going to do whatever. That 10 to 25% says one solution in a 10 to 25% application might be just add an energy recovery ventilator. It'll delay it long enough that it might not be a problem. Now, as a design engineer, I might say, hey, I'm going to get some sort of light and say, hey, this is what we're doing. You're going to have excursions, and this is why, because you didn't want to pay for the extra, the system, the dehumidifier that I want. So that rule of thumb says, so the rule of thumb that I deal with is 10% or less, not too worried about it generally, 10 to 25% outside air, it depends. I'm going to look at the application. Lots of dry heat, 
above 25% in almost most cases you're going to have happen. So that was the last question we're going to take online. We're going to turn that back to Tony so he can do his thing. Obviously I'm around, I'm around for the period of time. So if you had other questions you wanted to talk about, but th can't thank you everybody enough. It's been a lot of fun. I don't know how many people we had online. I think we had somewhere around 350 signed up for this event, 50 live, 300 internationally. So again, thank you so much. If you have questions, reach out to Tony. He shared a lot of information, a lot of chats, and then uh, he'll get back to me and pick on me about some of these other things. Again, thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Chris. That was awesome. Um, and thank you all so much for joining us. We really do appreciate it. It was so much fun. We're going to do a lot more of these. Please subscribe to us on YouTube. The link is in the chat or just click on the description below and subscribe to us. Any questions, you can contact me directly. My email and phone number is in the chat. Thank you all so much, and we hope to see you at the next one. Have a good day.